Hello, data pros, and welcome back to another exciting video in our AI and ML series. In our previous video, we explored the building blocks of machine learning and walked through the key steps of a typical ML project lifecycle. Today, we're diving deep into algorithms, the brains behind machine learning systems. We will understand the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning and explore some of the most commonly used algorithms, especially the ones you'll encounter in real-world projects, with simple and easy-to-follow examples. All right, let's jump straight into it. Machine learning is all about teaching computers to learn from data. You give the machine examples, and it uses algorithms to find patterns in those examples so it can make predictions later. Think of it like this. If you show it different examples of houses along with their prices, it learns to estimate the price of a new house it has never seen before. There are two main types of learning algorithms in machine learning, supervised and unsupervised. In supervised learning, we train a model using labeled training data. That means each example in the training dataset includes both the input features and the correct output label. The goal is to teach the machine the relationship between inputs and outputs so it can make accurate predictions during the inference phase. Common applications of supervised learning include house price prediction and sales forecasting. On the other hand, in unsupervised learning, the training data has no labels. The algorithm tries to find patterns or groupings in the data all by itself. Common use cases of unsupervised learning include house segmentation, data clustering, and customer segmentation. Open source projects like Scikit-Learn, XGBoost, LightGBM, and H2O offer a wide range of pre-built machine learning algorithms across both these categories. Let's dive into Databricks and see some of these algorithms in action. While I'm using Databricks, the code should work just fine on most Python-supported systems and platforms. I've also included the GitHub link in the description where you can copy these code snippets. Suppose we have a data set with the following. Size in square feet and number of rooms are the features or the inputs to the model. House price is the label or the value we want the model to predict. This is a typical regression task because house price is a continuous number. One of the simplest models we can use for this requirement is called linear regression. Linear regression tries to draw a straight line that best fits the data. Later, this line is used for making predictions. You can train a linear regression model using the scikit-learn library. When you call the fit function, the model learns the relationship between the input features and the output label. As a result, you get a trained model ready for making predictions. Now, let's make some predictions. This phase is generally called inference, where we just use the trained model to predict the prices of two new houses based on their size and number of rooms. At this point, it's worth noting that traditional programming is completely different in this regard. There's no learning involved. You simply hard code fix logic, which doesn't adapt or improve when the world around it changes. Next, moving on to another type of supervised learning, classification. In classification, the label is usually a predefined category. For example, you might want to predict whether an email is spam or not, or whether a loan application will be approved or rejected. While binary classification like yes or no categories is common, there are also situations where we need to classify data into more than two categories. For example, identifying the type of a vehicle as car, truck, bus, or motorcycle. Advanced classification models, which we'll cover later in this video, are well-equipped to handle such multi-class classification tasks. At this point, it's worth noting that classification stands in contrast to the regression use case we discussed earlier, such as predicting house prices, where the label is a continuous real number. For example, you might predict the price of a house, which could be any value like 2,000, 5,000.62, 3 million, or any other real number. However, in classification, the label consists of predefined categories. Some of you may feel confused because this model name contains regression in its name, but it's actually used for classification. That's a bit of a naming exception. 
Logistic regression calculates continuous values like a regression model, but it then applies a transformation to turn those values into categories, usually yes or no. If the computed value exceeds a certain threshold, it's classified into one category. If it's below, it's classified into the other. Because of this internal process, the word regression has misleadingly remained in the name even though it's technically a classification algorithm. Let's see logistic regression in action. We'll start with a simple data set where each row represents an email. If the email is from the company domain, it's represented by the feature from company domain with a value of one. Numerisky keywords is the number of potential spam keywords like free or offer in the email. Spam or not is the label. One means it's spam and zero means it's not spam. We'll now train a logistic regression model to classify emails as spam or not. And now let's make predictions for a few new emails. Here, we use the trained model to predict whether each new email is spam. For example, an email from a non-company domain represented by zero and containing three risky keywords is likely to be spam. This shows how we can use classification models, like logistic regression, for real-world use cases such as spam detection. Moving forward, let's talk about another popular supervised learning model, the decision tree. A decision tree is like a flow chart that makes decisions by asking a series of yes or no questions. For example, is the email from a company domain? Does it contain spam keywords? Are there spelling mistakes? Based on those answers, it moves through branches and makes a prediction. Here's how you can train a decision tree classifier using email data. Once the model is trained, we can make predictions in the same way we demonstrated before. This works great, but single trees can overfit and be less accurate. That's where ensemble models come in. Random Forest is an ensemble model. It creates many decision trees on random parts of the data and then lets them vote. It's like asking 100 experts and trusting the majority. Random Forest is one of the most popular models in production ML workflows. Here's how to train a random forest classifier in Databricks using Scikit-learn. As mentioned earlier, the random forest classifier can also be used for multi-class classification tasks where the target label has more than two categories. In the code example, we've used a random forest classifier to classify vehicle types into car, truck, bus, or motorcycle. There's also a random forest regressor for regression tasks. Here's the code snippet for that. I've commented out the lines, but feel free to uncomment it and use it as needed. Next, we explore another powerful method, gradient boosting. While random forest builds trees independently, Gradient boosting builds them sequentially. Each new tree tries to fix the mistakes made by the previous one. This makes boosting very powerful for accuracy. A popular implementation is gradient boosting regressor for regression problems and gradient boosting classifier for classification tasks. An even faster and more optimized version is XGBoost. This model is widely used in competitions and production systems. Here's how you can train XGBoost. All the models we've seen so far, such as linear regression, logistic regression, decision tree, random forest, gradient boosting, and XGBoost fall under supervised learning because they all require labels during training. Now, let's shift our focus to unsupervised learning. The key difference is that in unsupervised learning, we don't provide any labels for the algorithm to learn from. It has to find patterns and groupings in the data entirely on its own. K-means clustering is a common example of unsupervised learning, often used for tasks like customer segmentation. At the beginning of the learning process, we have no predefined customer groups. We want the model to discover them. For that, we can use clustering. Here's a simple data set with customer ID, monthly spend, and store visits per month. We'll use the K-means algorithm to group these customers. Now, we have two groups of customers automatically discovered based on their features or behavior. No labels were used or needed for training. 
Let's talk about another unsupervised model for anomaly detection, which is isolation forest. Isolation forest detects anomalies by isolating them from the rest of the data. It works by randomly selecting features and values and seeing how quickly a data point gets isolated. Outliers are isolated faster. Here's a simple example with transaction data. Now let's predict which transactions are anomalies. In this case, the transactions of 1,000 and 5,000 from high-risk countries are potential anomalies and the model marks them with a minus one, indicating they are outliers. DBSCAN, which stands for Density-Based Spatial Clustering of Applications with Noise, is another unsupervised learning algorithm. It works by grouping together data points that are closely packed and marking the low-density areas as anomalies or noise. Here is a sample code showing how it can be implemented. All of the algorithms we've covered are supported in Databricks and other leading data platforms. While we used beginner-friendly examples to explain the concepts, in upcoming videos, we'll show you how to integrate them with tools like the Databricks Feature Store, MLflow, and the Model Registry, making your ML solutions ready for real-world deployment. That's all for today. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button to stay up to date with our latest content. Thanks for watching.